Hello, welcome to chapter 16. This is week eight, uh, and we're gonna be covering chapter 16 and 17 this week. Uh, this chapter is going to be on food factors affecting health. So we're gonna begin talking about this chapter with healthcare disparities. Uh, this starts on page 302 in your book. Um, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, identified these specific oral health disparities in the Healthy People 2020 uh, that, they, the, that they did. So they identified a lack of annual preventive dental services for children and adolescents from families at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. And that just means that the United States has drawn a line and says this much income or below is the poverty line. Anyone who makes this much is like at the line below and above, obviously. So anyone who makes that line or even up to double of that poverty amount is going to have that lack of annual preventive dental services. More untreated dental caries in children ages three to nine come from families with incomes less than 100% of the federal poverty line. So people who make at that line or lower, typically children in, from those families between the ages of three and nine will have untreated caries. Fewer dental sealants in African-American adolescents. Fewer African-American adults ages 45 to 64 and persons with activity limitations having a full set of permanent teeth. So um, it just it highlights that African-Americans um, and uh, those of African-American descent will typically have uh, more health care disparities. It means they have less resources to uh, certain health care um, services. Uh, your book also talks about um, people who speak, understand, or read a language other than English when they live in the United States. So someone who doesn't speak English but lives here, um, they have a different level of acculturation. And acculturation is sort of the level or amount that someone um, like sort of picks up the habits and, and thoughts uh, thought processes of someone who lives in America. So, you know, people who come from other countries and then they move here, they think differently um, and that they un they understand illness differently than we do. Uh, and they have a different perspective on healthcare, different from what those who are born and raised in the United States have. Um, and I think what's important to note, even though your book doesn't specifically uh, it, you know, expressly write it, is that they're not necessarily bad opinions. Um, they're not, you know, less than American sort of opinions. They're just different. Um, and the, your book wants you to understand that um, healthcare providers who grow up in the United States um, are going to have at least a challenge in being able to relate to those who grew up outside of the United States. And what's important is that we both make the effort, or at least all the dental professionals, because we can't educate uh, every single individual who moves here uh, on this topic, um, that dental professionals should be um, understanding of that gap in world perspective and that we should try to understand where the other person comes from before we try to educate them because we need to know how they feel before we try to push our views on them basically. Uh, continuing with that last slide for those Healthy People 2020 um, um, identifications is also that fewer Hispanic adults will receive dental care, less of them uh, will seek dental care, and then more edentulous older adults between the ages of 65 to 74 who have less than a high school education will see some health care disparity as far as oral health goes. So uh, these are all just kind of, of um, you know, demographic markers that tell us that you know there's a chance that that person is in kind of a higher risk of, of having a healthcare disparity. Not necessarily that every Hispanic adult doesn't, or that you know every person who has less than a high school education is going to be a dentalist. That's not what those mean. It just kind of is they're at a higher risk for falling into those categories. All right, food patterns. 
are typically the uh, sort of preferences and the habits that people have around food. Um, they are generally going to be developed during childhood and they will reflect that family's lifestyle and its ethnic or cultural uh, I'm sorry as far as the influences go they'll be cultural they'll be socioeconomic status uh, symbolic uh, like religious um, geographic and psychological um, and it just basically, you know, people who come from different cultures, uh, even if they ate the exact same food, they would go about preparing it differently or they might have, uh, you know, different methods for consuming that food, you know, um, as far as like, you know, people here in the United States will typically sit in a chair and eat at a table, um, whereas, you know, other cultures may have a, like a low table on the floor. They might have even like a rug in certain like Middle Eastern cultures. They have a rug and they all kind of sit um you know cross ankle on the ground and they eat uh off of the you know sort of area that way so everybody depending on you know their culture will have different food patterns um socioeconomic status that's just their you know level of um of income uh symbolic we'll talk about religious um methods in a in later slide uh, geographical this is something you know that if we were in person I would really love to hear all of your stories about you know where you grew up and the types of patterns that that you have unfortunately uh, you know we're not together right now and so um, I don't get to hear all of your stories um, I mean me specifically I grew up in Michigan and uh, people in Michigan don't eat breakfast tacos I don't know if you guys know um, so we have different food patterns up in uh, northern states than they do here in Texas and then uh, psychological as well so you know different people uh, are, are just gonna have different uh, choices and different different methods for eating and, and everybody's different um, so all of these influence one's attitudes feelings and beliefs about food so like we talked about our culture plays a large role in our food patterns that we have and they're established um, as children and typically children as long as they live in an area where the food is still available and they're still you know able to eat it they'll continue to eat the food that they grew up eating um, and so those are going to affect those patterns regarding the time and number of meals per day. If you grew up with, you know, a household that's very busy in the morning and you get up and you rush out the door, you're going to be a household that doesn't eat breakfast. And so kids who grow up, you know, not really eating breakfast, well, they continue to not eat breakfast later in life. Um, foods that are acceptable for specific meals. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I will have breakfast foods only at breakfast and then I I only eat you know dinner foods at dinner and to me it's it's strange for me if I ate breakfast food for dinner uh, but some people do that and then uh, preparation methods you know so as far as like frying or boiling or baking and things like that uh, likes and dislikes so if you grew up around a food you're more likely to to enjoy eating it uh, whereas you know when you are an adult and you try different foods uh, some people are, are less open to uh, eating new types of foods uh, food suitable for specific members of a group uh, so you know there might be foods that only kids eat like here in the United States you know uh, a lot of people associate like dinosaur chicken nuggets with kiddos uh, that doesn't mean an adult can't eat a dinosaur chicken nugget it just means that they they don't typically uh, table manners, so how we behave as we consume uh, our meals, the social role of foods and eating. Um, so, you know, in my family, as we were growing up, uh, my dad sat at the end of the table and, um, you know, he was the one who um, would sort of commence the beginning and no one would eat until we all started eating together. Like you didn't take your plate and start eating until everyone was seated and, and ready. And then no one left the fan, like the table until everyone was done eating. And so just the kind of like the social aspect around food and you know, who eats first and, and things like that. I know uh, I have a, a friend who um, she won't eat a bite until her husband eats a bite. Like she makes him his plate and she gives it to him and 
she like watches to see when he puts the bite into his mouth and then she'll start eating. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that's, I think that's strange. I could never do that. So, uh, but that's how some people are. And then attitudes toward eating and health. So some people don't associate the types of foods that they eat with their health. They think that, you know, the only reason that they have high blood pressure or the only reason they have diabetes is because their family has diabetes. They don't associate the fact that the foods that they eat play a higher role in their overall health than does their genetics. But um, you know, those are all, all factors. Those are all cultural things, things you learn as you grow up. Many ethnic groups um, have brought a really rich heritage of uh, really diverse food patterns to the United States, and it has resulted in distinct and discrete patterns of food consumption. Uh, you can find this in your book in figure 16.1. Um, and I mean, I think that we are really... Uh, blessed to be able to enjoy so many different cultural cuisines um, and, and get to experience, you know, other parts of the world, um, which is why uh, I'm going to at least request that we're able to have a potluck um, and see how, you know, uh, well, I already have approval from uh, the PD, but I want to see if you guys are interested in doing that, where each of us bring uh, a dish that is sort of at least somewhat culturally tied, uh, you know, and if you're like me, you're, uh, I'm, I'm not really um, any one specific culture. And so um, I'm going to have to figure out something, but uh, I, I'd like to, for all of us to kind of share our culture in a way that, you know, other people get to experience and be open-minded with one another. All right, and then food has kind of a status and a symbolic influence too. So because of the symbolic meanings of certain foods, um, eating becomes associated with sentiment and assumptions about oneself and the world. Uh, it's just the choice of different foods influenced uh, can be from religious beliefs, availability of that food in your area, the cost of that food, uh, the cultural values and traditions, and even an endorsement or condemnation of a highly respected person. Um, so kind of my example of this was my grandpa um, grew up really, really poor uh, in rural Alabama. And he said that when he was a kid, they couldn't afford to eat meat, uh, that they would have like beans and cornbread all the time. That was kind of their their staple foods because it was cheap and they could afford it. And, and uh, you know, if they were to get meat, it was like a big deal. Um, and so, you know, when he got older and he could afford to eat meat more often, not only did, you know, meat become more available as he got older, uh, and it became more, you know, culturally acceptable for everyone to eat meat at every meal. Um, and he, you know, was able to afford it as well. And so he could buy the food. Um, and for him, like giving up meat is something that would be like a negative because it's, it's associated with poverty. However, you know, now when you look at people who, you know, go to Whole Foods or things like that, that has kind of like a, a status symbol of, you know, people who are willing to pay a lot of money for food. Um, and so different types of foods and, and, you know, even different, you know, kind of, um, sort of food patterns are to have different associations. Uh, so we bring up this betel nut thing. This isn't really in your book, uh, but I'm going to talk about it because it's a very popular board question. Um, you're, you're definitely going to see at least one patient who has chewed betel nut or likes to do this. Um, and it's, it's a nut, it, the picture was on the last slide of it, but it comes from a tropical palm tree and people chew on it, uh, and typically people from like South Pacific region, um, and it has kind of an energy boost when they chew on it, like the juice from it, uh, but it stains people's teeth like like this, like really, <laughs> really stained. And, um, and so people in those areas um, who can afford betel nut, and you know it's it's a habit that they like doing because it gives them a positive association. Um, so when people see those stained teeth, it's kind of a status symbol. It means that that person is affluent enough to be able to afford betel nut. Um, 
It is also considered a carcinogen from the World Health Organization, and it has been linked to oral and esophageal cancer, submucosis fibrosis, tooth decay, and reproductive issues, including low birth weight babies. Uh, so, you know, aside from, from those issues, um, you know, people who chew betel nut uh, actually enjoy it. Kind of, I mean, kind of like a tobacco. Like tobacco started out as one of those things of like, you know, everybody was smoking. You're only cool if you smoke. Uh, and then like, look at all the side effects of smoking, but it's not a bad thing because, you know, there's, there's kind of like a cool factor to it. Okay. So as far as like working with people who have different food patterns, um, you know, this is something that I run into on a daily basis, right? Not very many people feel about food the way that I feel about food. And I would be wrong to judge other people for their food choices in the same way that I want others to accept and, and respect my food choices. And so in this kind of thing, as far as for a dental hygienist, these are the guidelines that should be used. So you wanna be sensitive to other people's preferences. Avoid being judgmental because at the end of the day, you, you don't know what it's like to be them. You don't know what they know. So avoid judging them. Uh, and then treat each other, treat each patient with respect. Uh, you know, even if they don't eat meat, or even if they chew betel nut, or you know, even if they they you know uh, refuse to give up soda. Like you don't know what it's like to be them. Don't judge them. Just just accept them for where they're at. Um, intervention must be adapted to address cultural, personal, and ethnic preferences in order to be effective. So you know, if I sat down in the chair and someone said you have to start eating meat or else you know whatever, I'm probably not going to listen. I'm going to stop listening at the point where they say I have to do something that I feel I, I cannot do. So in the same sense, you want to kind of get to know what that person thinks is important so that the recommendations you give them don't go against their values. Uh, and you want to use open-ended questions to elicit information. So the thing with this one is you want to ask them things like, um, you know, what kinds of foods do you eat, right? Not uh, do you eat whatever this is, right? Because if you get yes or no questions, a lot of the time there's kind of like other information that you'll miss. Uh, for instance, in clinic, if you ask, you know, are, do you take any medication? Do you take anything, right? Is going to mean to some patients, do you take medications? And to other people, it's going to mean, you know, do you take supplements or vitamins, right? And so you have to be really specific and in those not like specific questions, but ask those open-ended questions specifically in order to get the kinds of answers that you're looking for. So uh, to many people, including dental hygienists, uh, they're convinced that their own beliefs, attitudes, and practices are the best. And then they assume that everyone should follow them. Right. And that would be it's, it's something called egocentrism. It's where we think that the way we look at the world is the only right way to look at the world. Uh, and we think that, you know, people who come from other countries and they move here, we think that we should, you know, teach them how to be. And that's that's simply not the case. What we need to do is is learn how they see the world and and so that we can kind of find a way to share our perspectives. All right, so affecting change, slide one of two. Oftentimes you'll find that as a dental hygienist, uh, you're not just you know teaching them about oral uh, health, you're also kind of teaching them about a lot of things. Um, and you're, you know, you're not just um, instructing them on how to do things, you're also going to have to be kind of like an educational specialist in understanding, you know, when are people ready to hear what I have to say? Um, and how do I go about saying it in a way that they're able to hear me? And uh, so, okay, so basic facts that may assist in approaching patients from various ethnic groups to promote sound nutritional practices. Uh, so your book talks about the people who uh, have a remarkable ability to obtain a nutritious diet out of available foodstuffs. So if you look, there are people from all over the world who have different staples in their diets. I mean, if you look at kind of like Irish and having the sort of potato um, and sausage sort of staple diet. And then you look at, you know, people from sort of um, West Asia who have more of a, of a rice 
uh, base to the diet. And then, uh, you know, people from like Hispanic culture is typically uh, pretty heavy in like corn based um, diets. Everyone has some type of staple in their diet. And what's amazing is that they're able to absorb what they need out of that food, even though they eat different foods from what we do. You can, you're going to run into a lot of people who eat, who, who never eat the foods you eat, and and they are just as, if not healthier, than you are. <laughs> um, so food patterns of other countries are, in some instances, nutritionally superior or at least comparable to ordinary American traditions. So, you know, uh, if you kind of come at people with the whole American diet of, of hamburgers and pizza, um, you know, most other countries are actually eating better than we are. Even, even countries that are considered kind of like third world countries uh, because they don't do as much um, processing to their food, but we're gonna talk about that later too. Uh, culturally preferred foods may be costly or unavailable in some communities. And here we talk about, you know, people who move to the United States um, and then they have to kind of go to one of those like specialty grocery stores in order to get foods that they're used to eating from their country. Um, those aren't going to be as available to them. And so they're more likely to, um, um, you know, begin eating more Americanized foods than people who are able to find their cultural foods uh, closer to home and are available. Basic facts that assist in approaching patients from various ethnic groups to promote sound nutritional practices. So each food or food related behavior and tradition is categorized as beneficial, neutral, or potentially harmful, right? Um, and the efforts at change should be focused on potentially harmful foods, behaviors, or choices. So if someone else is doing something different, but it's not hurting them, then you shouldn't try to get them to change it. That's that's not going to, they're not going to change it because it's not hurting them. If it's something like smoking, which is hurting them, then it is something you want to talk to them about changing. Um, food patterns are generally deeply ingrained, suggest minimal alterations in the patient's normal patterns. So, uh, you know, when patients are eating you know, the standard American diet, you're not going to come out and say, hey, you can never have a cheeseburger again, right? That That's not going to be received well. So if you come and say, hey, you know, you kind of want to limit your saturated fat intake. And so, you know, maybe consider eating out only three times a week instead of seven times. Um, cultural patterns tend to be used more consistently by older family members, like first generation immigrants. So here, um, you know, when someone moves to the United States and they uh, specifically like grow up in another country and then they move here, they're more likely to continue eating the types of foods they grew up eating, right? We have our food patterns. However, if they have children when they get here, their children are more likely to eat the kinds of foods that Americans eat. Um, and we see this a lot in uh, Japanese. Um, so ja uh, Japan has a really healthy diet, right? A lot of people in Japan live to be 100. Um, and they're considered one of the blue zones anyway. Um, so they have a predominantly like rice and vegetable uh, base to their diet. Um, and so when people of uh, people from Japan move to the United States, if they continue eating that type of diet, then they continue staying healthy. However, most uh, Japanese immigrants' children, when they grow up eating uh, American sort of diets, they end up having the same sort of chronic disease uh, at the same rate that uh, Americans have. Uh, whereas, you know, if they had stayed eating the sort of Japanese cultural dishes, then they would have had uh, chronic disease rates closer to uh, Japan's rates. Individuals from any culture have unique tastes and preferences. Therefore, stereotyping members of cultural groups should be strictly avoided. Dental hygienists should become familiar with patterns common in the local area. So, you know, if you're here, you probably want to be aware of, of breakfast tacos and, um, um, you know, the, the way that, you know, Texas, uh, you know, likes to eat steak and beef and things like that. So it's not going to be very beneficial for you um, to live in Texas and to try to tell people to, to give up eating steak. 
All right, so as far as religious food restrictions go, um, you're gonna find that people feel very strongly about food preferences. Like if they enjoy the taste of something, they're like not gonna wanna give it up. Um, but over time, if you can change their minds, then they're more likely to do so. However, when it comes to a religious food uh, or a religious food restriction, that's something that you're never going to get that individual to change. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely a waste of breath to try to get someone who is following a certain diet or pattern based on their religion to change. Um, it, it isn't beneficial for anyone. So you're better off trying to understand their religious um, behaviors and then make certain accommodations elsewhere in order to help sort of foster them following their religion. Um, in a healthy way. So religious beliefs affect eating patterns and attaches symbolic meanings to food and drink. And so here are some of those examples of that are the bread and wine that are served uh, during the Christian community uh, communion service, right? Um, as far as taking communion. Um, it mentions the Hindu reverence uh, for the cow in India, the month-long fast of Ramadan in the Muslim faith, and then uh, it talks about Seventh-day Adventists who are vegetarian or vegan. Uh, Seventh-day Advent, uh, Adventists are mostly known for living in California, uh, but there are also other uh, vegetarian, vegan sort of religions uh, like Buddhism, um, which don't, um, don't eat animals. Moving on to food budgets. Uh, this is when, you know, the a family has a certain amount of income and they have a certain portion of that income allocated towards food. Everyone spends a certain amount of their you know, money on food, right? Um, so evidence of poor or fair health status and malnutrition is going to go up as income level goes down. So um, what this means is that if you make more money, you're going to probably eat healthier. If you make less money, you will probably eat less healthy. That's sort of just how it works. Uh, low income households score below higher income households on healthy eating indices. Um, and there's reasons for that. So the average American family will spend around 10 to 15% of their income on food. Those at the poverty level spend as much as 33% of their income on food. And so if you're spending a third of the amount of money that you make in a month on food, you're probably going to prioritize getting enough calories um, and getting enough food over maybe eating the most healthy that you can, right? You're not going to be spending a lot of money trying new foods that are, you know, the new health craze. Um, foods supplying the most nutrients relative to uh, cost include beef, fresh potatoes, brown rice, wheat germ, milk, eggs, and peanut butter. Um, a lack of transport transportation may limit options for shopping. So, you know, if you live in an area where you don't have a car and you have to walk to the store, uh, then you're probably not going to walk to the nearest Whole Foods, which is you know, 10 miles away, right? You're probably going to walk the half a mile it takes you to get to the, uh, you know, CVS or Walgreens, and you're gonna do most of your shopping there, which means that you're gonna pay more money than you would if you were able to go to, you know, the food market or something like that, you know? Um, and so without transportation, low income consumers are often limited to shopping in those smaller independent stores common in those inner city areas, or they have to spend money in order to travel further away to the, the other grocery store and they end up spending the same amount of money anyway, um, or they'll uh, you know spend money on something that's sort of cheap and close, like delivery services or, or uh, you know, drive-throughs and things like that. Well, not drive through because they, they don't have a car. So as far as maintaining optimal nutrition during food preparation, your book goes into kind of how to properly prepare food and how that plays a role in the overall health for that food. Uh, and so it talks about the methods of preparation and it wants to discourage the addition of large amounts of fat 
for cooking. So no deep frying, uh, no, no frying in general. Um, and then to not discard water that vegetables are cooked in. Um, so veggies, when you cook them in, in like the water, that water does contain some of that nutrients and that broth. Uh, as far as food sanitation and safety goes, there are five major control factors for food safety. And the first one is um, uh, personal hygiene, right? This is on page 307 in your book, and it's kind of in the fourth paragraph down. It says the dietary guidelines provide food safety principles and guidance in general terms. So the first one is clean, which is like hand, uh, hand washing, food preparation surfaces, and food. Um, you know, if you haven't, you can ask someone who like washes your cutting boards and things like that. That's, that's going to have some cross-contamination. And then separate uh, in order to prevent cross-contamination. So you should never like cut up your chicken on the cutting board and then turn around and cut your veggies on the cutting board at the same time, right? You, you would definitely uh, prevent anything from touching. Um, cook, so in to recommend um, cooking things to the adequate safe temperature, the internal temperature, so that adequate cooking in order to kill bacteria. Um, the next one is chill, so maintain foods at a safe temperature, um, keeping those foods at, at that safe temperature. As far as the danger zone, so you want to keep foods either below or above either 40 degrees up to 140 degrees. So anything above 140 degrees is probably too hot for bacteria to grow. Anything below 40 degrees is too cool for bacteria to grow. And avoiding foods from unsafe sources. So, you know, it talks about... Um, you know, where you buy foods. Um, I think it says only 6% of people think that raw vegetables could have germs present. Uh, this is not true. All, all vegetables have germs on them. All fruits have germs on them. So when you take them home, you should wash them. All right, as far as the effects of processing on nutrients, so like when you cook it, what happens to the food, right? Well, the nutrients are considered stable if at least 85% of the original level is retained during processing and storage. Um, and then food processing attempts to maintain optimal qualities of color, flavor, texture, and uh, nutritive value. Your book starts to go into kind of how cooking um, will reduce the amount of nutrition in the diet and which nutrients are kind of more susceptible. So uh, water-soluble vitamins are going to be the most affected by cooking. So when you when you cook your food, right, you're probably going to destroy a lot of the vitamin Bs um, and vitamin C. Um, but there are a couple of like uh, um, caveats to those things like um, tomatoes, carrots, sweet potatoes, peaches, beans, legumes, tuna, and salmon um, are usually not too harmed by the, the cooking process and by the the harvesting process. Um, and then your book talks about the different types of, of ways that they transport foods. So, you know, they do like freezing them. Um, so fresh fruits and veggies have that the highest amount of nutrient content. Um, but it, when they pick that fruit or vegetable, they immediately begin to degrade, right? They oxidize. And so um, from the moment that it's picked, if it has a far way to travel, like maybe if you get your bananas from Costa Rica, um, then it's probably not going to be as good for you. It's not going to have as many nutrients in it by the time it gets to, you know, your local HEB than it did, um, you know, the day after it was picked down in Costa Rica. If you ate it there, you'd get more nutrient from it. Um, and it talks about uh, like frozen veggies, uh, frozen foods are going to be the next best choice. So if you can't have it fresh, then uh, frozen is going to be the next way because most of the time, um, and even in certain cases, it's going to be more nutritious because they pick it right at that perfect ripeness and then they, well, typically they blanch the food because they want to kill bacteria and then they freeze it and they flash freeze it really, really quickly so that uh, it doesn't lose a lot of the nutrients in that process. Um, but then you have to thaw it so it's going to lose some of the nutrient. <laughs> um, and then also like canning certain items uh, because it sits in water uh, over time, it will lose some of its uh, nutrition. But there are obviously certain exceptions to that. 
Um, moving to page 309, those convenience foods, these are popular because they come in packages, it saves time in meal preparation, planning, purchasing, and cleanup, right? They're really easy. You just go to the store and pick it up, open it, and you eat it. So, of course, it's very convenient, and because of that, it's pretty popular. We live very fast-paced lives. Many of us are too busy in order to kind of make things from scratch. Um, however, if it's going to come in that bag, they're going to put preservatives in it in order to make it more shelf stable. So it will last longer because if it goes bad before they sell it, then they don't make money off of it. So when they make it more uh, shelf stable in adding preservatives, they're going to add more fat and more sodium to it in order to make it, you know, not only taste good so they can try to entice you to buy it over other items, but they're also going to make it last longer. Uh, next up is irradiated foods. Uh, this is actually something I learned from this book. Uh, this wasn't something we covered whenever I went through dental hygiene um, back in the day. And so uh, irradiated foods is where they actually expose food, fruits and veggies usually, to ionizing radiation. They straight up like zap the food in order to kill bacteria causing uh, well, disease causing bacteria and molds, right? And what this does is because the mold and the bacteria isn't all helping the sort of breakdown process of the food, it actually makes the food last longer, which I, that kind of blows my mind. Um, you can find in your book, it's on page 310. At the top, there's like a little label for it, uh, for what it looks like when the food has been irradiated. It does not look like a uh, it's, it's certainly not the um, x-rays sort of caution fan uh, for sure. It looks like a little a little plant in, in the middle of a earth um, sort of thing. And sometimes this is also called cold pasteurization. Uh, I know I'd heard of cold pasteurization in the past, but I had no idea that it was actually um, irradiated. Uh, your book does say, though, irradiated foods are not sterile. They're just like less can't like um they're just less bacteria all right moving into organic so uh yeah i'm not sure if we've touched a soft spot in the the writer's sort of uh feelings but organic really kind of takes a turn um as far as trying to show whether organic food is good or bad, uh, and it doesn't really make a decision either way. So the only thing that makes a food organic is if it is grown without synthetic pesticides. Synthetic pesticides, okay? Not pesticides, because you can put pesticides on organic food, just the synthetic pesticides. I'm, I said that a couple of times, so I think that's important, right? growth hormones, antibiotics, or genetic engineering. So no GMOs. They don't feed uh, organic sort of food livestock hormones or antibiotics, and they don't use synthetic pesticides. So the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, does not support claims um, of or that organic food is safer or even more nutritious than conventionally produced foods. So just because you're eating something that's organic doesn't mean it has more vitamins and antioxidants or anything like that. There, there was a study that said that it did, but then there was another study that said that it didn't. So uh, we're going to talk about that in research, how studies often contradict themselves um, and each other and, and kind of some of the ways to go about navigating that world. Um, but basically, the USDA hasn't really decided either way. Um, now, typically, the cost is much higher than conventional products, and that's due to a couple of different things. So more of the time uh, when you're growing crops without those pesticides, without the, the non or the synthetic pesticides, right, um, you're going to lose a lot more of the crop to critters and bugs and things like that, right? You're going, you're not going to get as high a yield from your crops. So uh, they have more risk involved. And so they sell their foods for higher. Um, as far as livestock goes and animals, uh, animals that are raised by organic producers, they can't give that antibiotics 
to stimulate growth. So antibiotics aren't ever given to stimulate growth, by the way. Uh, but they don't give them any growth hormones in order to make them grow faster because then you know you can eat them faster. Like if you can produce more by making them grow up faster and then slaughtering them, then then you're able to make more money, right? That's how um, the uh, you know agricultural business works. Um, but in organic, they they aren't allowed to do that. So they don't give them antibiotics, and they well they don't give them antibiotics unless they're sick. So if the animal becomes sick um, and it's you know, gets a visit from the veterinarian and they prescribe um, antibiotics for that animal specifically, then that animal can have antibiotics. Um, but they don't just put it in the food for all of the animals uh, the way that they do often for um, uh, regular agricultural. Um, the other thing, well, with regular agriculture, they feed a lot of the animals the antibiotics. They're actually fed 80% of the world's um, antibiotic that is produced. Um, and they have like a sort of period before slaughter where they kind of wash out. So they stop feeding them antibiotics uh, a certain amount of time in order to uh, let that antibiotic uh, kind of leave the animal system before they slaughter it so that there's no active antibiotic in the animal at the time that the consumer consumes. Um, and so there has been actually a sharp rise in the consumer demand for organic food uh, lately um, because people are becoming you know, more aware and, and, and things like that. I, now, I don't necessarily think that organic is better. Um, it, you know, it, it depends on the food. Um, so there are certain foods which have more pesticides than other foods. Uh, if you look up the words dirty dozen in uh, on well, online, anytime you're looking at fruits and veggies, um, you're going to find that there are 12 specifically um, foods that they recommend buying organic um, because they are grown a lot. Things like apples uh, and strawberries um, that you should buy organic because um, they're not, they don't come with as many uh, pesticides as do, like if you're buying bananas or oranges or something with a peel that you're going to end up peeling off the outside anyway, those are typically safe to buy non-organic. Um, the other thing your book talks about is the difference between organic whole milk and uh, like the traditional or conventional milk um, is the, the only one that has a true nutritional difference is that conventional milk will be higher in iodine and selenium than organic milk is. Um, actually, the reason for this is interesting because they will, like when they put the machine in order to milk the cow, um, they will um, like use iodine in order to clean the animal before they put the machine on it. Um, and so it comes out higher with iodine in the milk than does the organic version. Okay, so moving to fast food and other food establishments, if you turn the page to 312, um, all the way at the top before you get to fast food section, it talks about the term natural and how a lot of food packaging lately is using the term natural and that natural doesn't mean anything, okay? The FDA hasn't established a standard for that word. So if you see the word natural on any product, it's just a marketing scam. It's not any more natural than any other product. Okay, just just so you know, you know, you come back a couple of years from now, read this again, you're gonna see, be able to remember that. Okay, so fast food and other establishments. So the average meal at a fast food restaurant is somewhere between 900 and 1800 kilocalories, which is somewhere between 33 to 66% of the amount of food uh, for young men, and then it's 45 to 90% for young women. So a, a woman who eats one fast food meal, that's like her entire day's worth of calories. Um, I mean, if you're short like me, that is more than your entire day worth of calories. So, um, you know, fast food isn't necessarily unhealthy for you, right? It, it has certain nutritional components, right? It has proteins and fats and things that you you need, but most of the time those foods are serving uh, way too a big of a portion. Um, the other thing is that they want the food to taste really good, right? So that you come back and eat there again. And so they will up the amount of sodium and fat that is in their foods in order to get you to like it. 
And if you like it, you'll come back and eat there again. Um, they do mega size portions. It, well, we already talked about that. The portion is like an entire day's worth of calories. So you can eat one, you know, meal and that be your whole day, or you can eat four entire like meals and, and it'd be the same amount of calories, which we're going to see. Um, wise choices are possible. Um, so since May of 2018, they have mandated that restaurants um, sort of post or publish the amount of kilocalories that are in each of the food sources uh, or food choices. Um, and it's, it's on everything. So if you're going through the drive through they have to have all of their calories posted uh, when, whenever you're making the decision, whatever menu you're looking at, um, because they want consumers to be able to uh, make informed decisions. So here is an example of that. You have both of these, these you know, sort of arrangements of food are... 1,575 calories, right? But on the left-hand side, there's more highly dense, like um, calorie dense foods, right? Like potato chips and a cinnamon bun. And that's actually only half of a cheeseburger and probably a third of the amount of fries you would get if you, you went out. I don't know what that little item is here. Um, this thing, I'm thinking it's like a piece of bread. I, I'm not really sure. And then I think that that's like fettuccine alfredo, like this thing right here. So that's a, actually probably not the amount of pasta that one would eat in a in a meal. Um, but all of this food together, for you know a smaller woman, this is this is a day's worth of calories, right? But here on the right hand side, this is a significantly a uh, higher volume of food, right? If you were to eat all of this food, which I don't even know if I would be able to eat all of that food. Um, so if, you know, if you were following maybe uh, some type of, of calorie restriction, um, then you're going to want to eat things that are low energy density or those they're, they're high in nutritional value, right? Like if you were to look and, and see all of these veggies, all of these colors that are in all of this food, you would know that, hey, there's probably a lot more vitamins and minerals in the food that's on the right-hand side than, you know, whatever is in this, uh, this burger, right? There's probably more nutrition in the one on the right and there's more volume. So you know, there's more fiber. You're gonna be eating food that fills you up and keeps you full for longer. And you know, it's it's not gonna be as ridiculously delicious, right? It looks delicious actually, but um, it's not gonna be as delicious as a cinnamon bun, okay? N nobody's messing around here and thinking that the cereal here is gonna be as good as the cinnamon bun, but it's going to keep you full for longer. Okay, so as far as food additives go, um, this starts on page 312 in your book. They are uh, typically um, labeled as generally recognized as safe. So that grass, which we, we talked about in one of the other um, chapters. So um, they are typically meant to be safe and they're not necessarily bad. There are actually quite a bit of, of benefit from food additives. So 99% of additives are derived from natural sources or they're synthetically produced to be identical to the natural chemical substance. So like folic acid, for instance, they add to um, you know a lot of cereals and, and uh, cornmeal and things like that. They're just as good as eating folate. Um, there are benefits to eating food additives, and you'll see this in your book on page 313. Um, on the next page, it has like a little list of the five different kinds. Um, so as far as the benefit goes, they improve nutritional value. So the enrichment and fortification process will reduce the amount of malnutrition in the United States, right? We learned in the other chapter that the folate that they started supplementing the food with reduced the amount of neurotube deficiency or neurotube defects in babies, right? So that's because of a food additive. Um, they help to maintain wholesomeness and palatability of foods. So bacterial contamination can cause foodborne illnesses, right? But preservatives will retard the spoilage that's caused by mold, air, bacteria, fungi, or yeast. It's going to help to preserve that natural color and flavor. 
Um, they help to maintain product consistency. So they help to you know, prevent the food from spoiling uh, so quickly. Uh, they provide leavening or they control pH. So leavening agents like yeast and baking powder, they are used in order to sort of change the consistency of the product. Um, and the same thing with the pH. We want uh, something that will control that pH level. Um, and then they enhance the flavor and appearance. So when you look at something, you know, and it's a bright color, like a um, sort of like a bright green of spinach, or if you look at the spinach after like two days being uh, left on the counter, it's kind of like all wilted and, and dark. Um, it's going to, food additives help to make the food look better, which makes you want to eat it. All right, so food fads. Um, a food fad is a catch-all term, and it covers all aspects of nutritional nonsense, <laughs> characterized by exaggerated beliefs about the value of nutrition in health and disease. So this is any time uh, a food sort of pattern emerges, and it it comes out saying it's like a it's gonna cure things or it's this you know you're gonna lose weight like magic or or anything like that if it comes out saying it's gonna cure you of disease and it's gonna you know help you grow your hair back or it's gonna you know and any of those kind of really crazy huge claims that you know certain diets make those are considered food fads um, and they are purveyors of misinformation. They capitalize on our fears and our hopes. So our fear maybe is that we will lose all of our hair, right? For like men usually. Um, and so that's our fear, but like they're gonna come out and say, you know, if you eat this bottle of pills every month, then you're not gonna lose your hair. Well, you know, it's a good chance that people will buy it in order to not lose their hair, but is it gonna actually prevent them from, from hair loss? No, probably not. Um, and then as far as hopes go, like there's a lot of people out there who hope to lose weight, especially here in the United States. You know, obesity is pretty prevalent. And so, you know, when people come out with that, what was it, the, um, Garcinia Cambodia or whatever it was that came out, uh, gosh, years ago, um, people really started taking it um, because they had this idea that it was going to help them lose weight. It was going to be this magic pill that was going to do things for them. And it didn't. At, at the end of the day, it the only way to lose weight, there's, there's no secret. The only way to lose weight is to consume less calories and to burn more calories or burn more calories than you lose. Right. And so there, there's no way around it. There's nothing that you can do that is going to magically fix anything. It, if you, if you want to prevent disease and lose weight, you have to, you have to work for it. There, there's no way around it. Um, food quackery is uh, just a funny word. I never imagined I'd, I'd be saying that, um, in a recording of some kind. Uh, so it's a promotion of nutrition related products or series having questionable safety and or effectiveness for the claims. So a couple of years ago, they had like this uh, fad, I think it was like Beyonce or something like that, where they were, they were drinking water with lemon and cayenne pepper and like maple syrup or something like that. You weren't supposed to eat any food. You were just supposed to have this concoction and, uh, and it was going to fix everything for you and all of that. But, but can you see how maybe telling people that they shouldn't eat food at all, that they should just have like a drink, um, is, is actually potentially harmful for you. Um, so I mean, you have to be really careful with certain food fads. Um, so given the right circumstances, such as confronting a chronic or incurable disease, everyone is capable of exchanging sound judgment and common sense for the promise of a miracle cure, right? If it's something that I'm worried about and you suddenly come along saying that, you know, if I just do this one simple thing, I can fix it. I'm, I, I kind of want to believe that it's true. So sometimes I believe things, even though I know it's probably not true. So if it sounds too good to be true, it's, it's probably too good. Uh, numerous unproven theories abound uh, regarding food allergies and intolerance from illegitimate diagnostic testing to treatment with diets and supplements that have not proven effective in scientific studies. So uh, this is the part where, you know, kind of, we kind of get into um, 
evidence-based and, and talking about that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, the main thing here is that if, uh, if the only proof for why something works is uh, an anecdote, so someone comes along and says, it worked for me, um, you know, I lost all this weight, and it's like that you're, you're saying that this is why you lost all the weight, but we don't know. Those two things are both happening simultaneously, but we don't know that the one thing caused the other, right? As far as being able to identify those sources of nutrition misinformation, uh, your book comes up with four valuable guidelines that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this was in 1994, to help prevent that misinformation. So A, there's an association between two events. It's not the same thing as a cause and effect, right? So just because, you know, uh, there's, you know, in the summertime, there is an increase in boating accidents, right? And then there's also an increase in ice cream consumption. It doesn't mean that I ice cream eating causes boat accidents, right? Both of those things happen simultaneously because it's hot outside and people eat ice cream when it's hot and they go on the lake when it's hot, right? It doesn't mean that one causes the other just because they are positively correlated. Correlation does not equal causation. This is something we're gonna definitely get into when we talk about research. Um, demonstrating one link in a postulated chain of events does not mean that the whole chain has been proven. So just because we say, you know, you were able to get from A to B with whatever this is, doesn't mean that they got from B to C and C to D. So we can't say that, you know, this one thing is going to get you from A to D, okay? Uh, probabilities are not the same as certainties. So just because you should lose weight doesn't mean you're absolutely going to lose weight. Um, the way that a scientific result is framed can greatly affect its impact. So um, just because the study looks like it's going to produce uh, an effect, like it's going to show us what it's supposed to show us, right? Like we set up the research study and we think it's going to give us these results because this is this is how we set it up. We may not, we may be unaware of certain variables um, and so it doesn't necessarily give us those results. Or just because it gave us those results doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily because of the reason we thought, right? It could be from a completely unre uh, unthought of variable. Um, your book also talks about single studies. So a single study is never perfect. Um, it, it could just be a fluke. There's often times where they do a study and, and something comes out and it's like 100% of the research participants had this effect and it turns out there were only two research participants or um, you know I think there's no one study is ever perfect so in order you will we'll learn it in research but in order for a research study to be uh, given uh, validity in, in understanding that it is really producing the result uh, that we think it's producing, we have to be able to reproduce it. So in order to uh, under, you know, for a study to have merit, to have value, it has to be reproduced and it needs to give a consistent uh, result every single time. Uh, your book also talks about the internet <laughs> and how it is an, a completely unregulated source of nutrition information. Um, don't go there for nutritional information. You will uh, it, definitely run into blogs and, and opinions of things and anecdotal information. Um, there will be certain sections of your dental hygiene um, curriculum where they talk about uh, the types of sources that you should find in order to uh, be able to trust the information that you're getting. All right, so as far as what's our role in all of this, right? We're at the end of this chapter, but you know, all, all of this information is great, you know, culture and, and, and misinformation and all of that, but why do we need to know as dental hygienists, okay? And the reason is that we need to be able to assess our patients' use of food fats, economic level, education level, and nutrient adequacy of any fad diet that's undertaken, right? So if our patient comes in and they say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm on this new diet and you know, I only have water with lemon and cayenne pepper, um, then we need to, you know, we need to listen to the person. We need to try to understand where they're coming from. You know, they certainly 
um, have a goal in mind. They're very disciplined. Um, and so we need to try to understand where they're at and, uh, and assess whether or not is, is it beneficial for them? Is it neutral or is it harmful? And if it's harmful, then that is when we need to try to uh, provide education. Um, and education is not necessarily the same thing as a recommendation, right? Our education process might be that, hey, you should seek help. Um, we should provide positive advice based on a broad knowledge base and understanding of nutritional concepts and current research findings. So, you know, um, while I would like to think that this course is all of the nutritional information you need, uh, I that, that would be um, pretty naive of me. So I would like to know that or to think that you're out there after you graduate uh, learning more about the nutritional uh, effects of of oral health on systemic health and and uh, how all of those three components play a role with each other. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in the next chapter too. Um, do not offer remedies unless they have been demonstrated to be safe and effective. So unless uh, you, know, you are able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that your recommendation is uh, solid, it has evidence-based, then uh, don't recommend it. It is not your job. You are not a registered dietitian. Uh, you cannot give recommendations uh, based on these things because if that person goes and, you know, what if they have some kind of uh, contraindication with something that they're taking and you didn't know about something like that, then uh, then it's on you. You're, it's cause it, that's your license. Um, and then anytime there's kind of a question about whether that person should go see a registered dietitian, there's, they should probably go and see a registered dietitian. So uh, referral and, and, and um, it's kind of recommending they seek uh, a professional of the specific skill is, is probably our biggest role. Understanding, hey, does this person need to see a registered dietitian and then recommending that they, they go see them. Okay, so some of those referrals that we can refer them to, um, there is the Area Information Center, or if you dial 211, um, it has comprehensive databases of resources, and they're going to include federal and state and local community-based and private uh, nonprofit organizations. But if you're if you're wondering about where to send someone, um, the Area Information Center is going to be the best place because then they're going to kind of help to guide them towards. Uh, programs that are specific for that person's needs. Um, next up is SNAP, so the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. These used to be called the, the Food Stamp Program, um, and it is the cornerstone of the U.S. Nutrition Safety Net. Um, this is an aspect of kind of our government um, kind of stepping in and trying to help with uh, low-income um people and, and trying to make sure that they're able to buy food and things like that. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of sort of controversy over whether or not the uh, you know food stamps or SNAP program is effective, whether or not it is actually helping people. Uh, I know that I've heard uh, a lot of stories of people who are you know at the grocery store and there's like a cart in front of them that's just completely full of food and it's like all junk food and the person is gonna buy with with their ebt card uh with the electronic uh benefits card is the um is like how they use it now they're no longer like food stamps they're like electronic cards um and uh, I've also heard a story of, you know, someone who like tried to barter their uh, SNAP benefits. So like, hey, I'll buy your groceries if you give me the cash for uh, the amount that it is. Um, I've seen people like try to sell it for like two to one. So like I'll buy two dollars worth of your groceries if you give me one dollar of, you know, cash. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not going to say that people don't abuse the system. They, they absolutely do. Of course, you know, any time that there's a, a, a structural sort of benefit in place, there's going to be people who abuse it. But I have kind of a, a unpopular opinion in, in that, you know, I think that if it helps even one kid uh, out there to have food, and to be able to go to school and not worry about 
whether or not they're going to eat dinner that night, um, I think it's working. And I, I'm willing to pay my fair share of taxes uh, in order to prevent even one kid from going to bed hungry or um, you know, from having to, to suffer from that kind of lifestyle. Uh, you know, you guys learn Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So uh, safety is number one, but then, but then food, survival. Um, and so if kids are, are worrying about, you know, whether or not they're going to eat or they're so hungry, they can't, they can't focus on school. They can't learn things. And, um, and so I, I think we should keep doing it. Um, even, even though I know that people are, are taking advantage of it because, um, I think, I think it's still doing its job. Um, the next one uh, is the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. This is WIC, um, and this is designed for low income, but a high risk population. So people who are pregnant, who are nursing, um, or children, uh, infants, obviously, and children up to five years old, right? Because we talk about how important proper nutrition is for those early years. Um, and WIC kind of comes along with a uh, education portion. So they do uh, food education and they do referrals to healthcare sort of sources. Uh, but you'll find like in the grocery store, like next to the price of the food, there's like a little, I think it's like pink or it might be green. I don't know. Um, like little sticker that says WIC. Um, and it means that you can buy that item with your WIC benefits. Um, it's, it's very specific, like they, they'll offer like two gallons of milk or, you know, dry beans or a block of cheese, or they don't offer a lot of like, you know, processed foods. WIC doesn't. Now, SNAP is different. SNAP, you can buy anything uh, except for like cooked foods, like, um, you know, like you can't buy the rotisserie chicken, I think. Um, and you can't go to like the restaurant with your, uh, food like food stamp the snap benefits but uh like with WIC, it's it's much more structured so you get you know a certain amount every uh every time um and it's, it's really designed to try to make sure that parents are buying the specific needs for kids um, as far as usda breakfast and lunch programs uh, these are the school-based programs and they provide nutritious free and reduced priced meals for children at schools um, so depending on you know where your kid goes to school um, either you apply for the program and you have to kind of like share your uh, income information and then either you're eligible or you're not or if you go if you you know your kid goes to school in a certain area where a certain percentage of the uh, people who live in that area would qualify then just like every kid gets it um, and so uh, it, it depends on where you live and it also kind of sometimes just depends on how much you make um, the nutrition program for the elderly which is title three this provides group and home delivered meals uh, this is the meals on wheels and this is for elderly people as it says um, for uh, you know, people who are are at risk of nutritional deficiencies are old, older people. We had a whole chapter on that. And then the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, the EFNEP, assists with meal planning, budgeting, cooking, and other food and nutrition related problems. So this one is more so like an educational process. Um, you know, you go and you sign up for classes and they'll teach uh, about how to meal plan and how to budget your meal plan and and how to you know cook the the food and things like that so um if you think that your patients might be eligible for one of these programs or you know maybe you are eligible for one of these programs um then you should definitely look into one of them uh more um the next one is Head Start. So Head Start is a preschool education program for low income families. Um, this is for like the preschool itself is only for low income families. Um, you have to like qualify for Head Start. I remember when I first moved to Texas, I thought um, that my daughter would be eligible. Like I was like, oh, Head Start's preschool. Like I want my daughter to go to preschool. Um, and so I didn't realize that it was something you had to like qualify for i thought like all kids could go to preschool um that's actually not the case um and so 
like daycare centers will usually have sort of like a preschool sort of thing that they do um, or you can like specifically pay to send your kid to preschool um, but if you are eligible through head start then then uh, they go to preschool for free um, locally funded food agencies provide assistance through food banks and food pantries so uh, you know food banks are pretty amazing usually once a year Concord will have some sort of food drive for the food bank um, I one of my patients actually used to work for the food bank she was a chef well, she still is a chef I just don't see her anymore um, and she did a lot of the like she would talk about how you know the in the food bank obviously the food that gets donated is it has a lot of variety to it and so it was kind of cool to listen to her talk about how you know they would take whatever was donated and then they would try to turn it into like meals <laughs> and I, I don't know like to me that's kind of mind-blowing to like it's basically like every woman ever has to like well not woman but you know people go in and they like open the pantry and you're like okay what am I gonna cook for dinner what can I make with these items here and they're like random items um, so that's that's kind of how the food bank worked for her um, if you are interested in volunteering uh, the food bank usually has something going on um, to, in order to kind of help you with with some of that um, sort of charity work things like that and that is the end of chapter 16 I will see you guys in chapter 17